I'll mention that again, as I'm sure he's going to mention, at every stop on his book tour, Mark wrote this book here. Projects like Mark's, Mark, where did you write your book? Ah, ah. Projects like Mark's are at the heart of what we do. The Wilson Center gives exceptionally bright people the resources they need to do deep original analysis, and it pays off. As many of you know, the latest Pulitzer Prize for nonfiction went to yet another Wilson book, Joby Warwick's Black Flags, The Rise of ISIS. This, is, this event is part of a new initiative we call Books at Wilson, dedicated to promoting the extraordinary work of our scholars. So we have high expectations for alter egos. I hope you'll, you've all ordered copies, and I'm sure many of you saw the big excerpt in the Times Magazine, the New York Times Sunday Magazine, How Hillary Clinton Became a Hawk. Because we gave Mark so much support, I feel free to make a suggestion, and I made it to him walking in here. I personally don't think hawk and dove are helpful labels. National security decisions aren't one-dimensional. And I think one of the things Mark does a good job of highlighting is that there is a diversity of views, not just across our dysfunctional parties, but within them, too. Nobody owns one label. And there is common ground. That's the other thing people need to understand. We all want, all of us want a strong, uh, all of us want strong national security, even if we disagree on the policies that will get us there. For my part, I'll say that as we head toward the general election, I hope voters keep in mind that security is far more than military might. It's also the strength of our economy, the strength of our democratic inclusive institutions, and the strength of our values. Before I let Mark speak to some of those ideas and to his book, I want to give a serious shout out for just 30 seconds to Andrea, who will moderate the discussion. Ever since she was her college radio station's first female program manager, Andrea's been blazing trails in journalism. She wrote a book about it, a great book about it. But tragically, she didn't write that book here. Next book, Andrea. Next book here. <laughs> Next book here. Nobody works harder or sleeps less than Andrea Mitchell, and she brings an incredible wealth of experience to today's discussion as, in addition to the presidential campaign. Just a few days ago, she interviewed Secretary Clinton for MSNBC. I love and admire her. Even though she never takes my tips on work-life balance, she and Mark will now have a great conversation after he intros his book. So please welcome both of them now. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jane Harmon. And thank you to the Wilson Center for hosting us today. I could not be more pleased and flattered that Mark uh, asked if I would be here with him today because uh, Mark is really the, the gold standard of journalists covering <coughs> foreign policy. And this book just proves once again uh, what a trailblazer he is. He was my seatmate often on those horrible, uh, the, the horrible because of the, the airplane, uh, the Secretary of State's airplane, which I first started flying uh, after it was rolled out to replace the 707 uh, with Madeleine Albright. The old 757 has not been updated in all these years. And there's a backstory as to why it cannot get from here to Europe without a refuel in Shannon. Uh, right. It involves uh, the Appropriations Committee uh, at the time and the need to refuel in Alaska. Uh, Senator Ted Stevens uh, made sure that it was not a longer range plane. So we, we shared many long flights and refuels together. But then he moved on to the White House and has the unique perspective of having covered both Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama. And I want to just ask you to speak for a, a moment about your book, and then I'll ask you some questions, and then we'll have questions from all of you. Because Alter Egos is the perfect roadmap, not only to Hillary Clinton's mind and heart and the political strengths and weaknesses and the foreign policy strengths and weaknesses, but the Obama legacy in foreign policy, the relationship between these two fascinating political figures. And it is the template, I think, uh, for those who, of us who are political junkies with which to view, against which to view this campaign, such as it is in the last 48 hours, we see the shape of the general election and the candidates and the nominees, uh, presumptive nominees, uh, indeed, after Kasich dropped out, NBC officially 
uh, is now designated Donald Trump the presumptive Republican nominee because he has no longer any opposition. Normally we wait until uh, they reach the magic number so of, of delegates. So uh, we are now in very, very strange terrain indeed. I, in 40 some years of covering politics, have never seen anything like this. Uh, I'm not enjoying it. It's not the campaign I wanted to be the capstone to this career. <laughs> but uh, this book, Alter Egos, is the greatest way to try to grapple with the issues that I hope will be debated intensively in the media and in, among the voters and in, in all of, among all of you, rather than just uh, chasing Twitter feeds and uh, other social media apps and um, insults back and <laughs> forth between the two candidates. Mark? Um, thank you so much, uh, Andrea. I, I was enormously tickled that Andrea agreed to do this not just because she's famous, but because uh, I discovered, as Jane suggested in her introduction, that Andrea is, is the most amazing shoe leather reporter that you'll ever encounter. And I, I just one small anecdote to illustrate that. I was on the plane with her, about to take off on a long trip, and I had written something that involved Tom Donilon, the national security advisor, uh, in an internal debate, and she came up to me and he, she said, what, what's going on with this Tom Donilon thing? And I said, uh, you know, it, this is what I hear and I'm not exactly sure. And she said, well, let's ask him. And I said, oh, fine. I mean, I normally didn't email Tom Donilon and get immediate replies. And she took her Blackberry out and punched away. And then, and then I sent, went and sat down and she came back later and she said, I think I know a little bit more. And so I thought, that's a terrifyingly good reporter <laughs> and terrifyingly well connected reporter. Um, and just quickly about Jane, um, the, the, um, the Wilson Center has become this go-to place. I, I, so many of my colleagues have now made this stop in their career and I think we all agree that it's, it changes a lot for us and how we think about um, our jobs and journalism and it's such a, a stimulating and friendly environment and you have such a tolerance for the way journalists think, which is very different than the way academics think or public policy people. Um, so I think this isn't a unique institution in Washington. I, I just love the fact that you've created this great legacy. Um, and I, I actually couldn't think of a better place to have, have written this. Um, so, uh, and also I can't help but say it's, it kind of um, gives me a kick that two formidable, impressive, accomplished women are the uh, people who are my partners today since I'm writing a book about a formidable, accomplished woman. Um, so it's all very appropriate feeling to me. Um, very quickly on the book, um, I, uh, as I, as Jane and Andrea said, I covered both Clinton and Obama as foreign policy figures. I didn't cover the Clinton campaign in 2008 or the Obama campaign, um, but I, I ver viewed them very much as foreign policy figures. And like many reporters who, who began covering Hillary Clinton in 2009, I went in thinking, well, maybe these two are going to hate each other and there's going to be a lot of sniping and leaks and, and it's going to be contentious and maybe it'll even end in misery. Um, and of course, none of that happened. In fact, it was really the opposite. They worked uh, publicly um, very much in lockstep. It was a, it was a very harmonious collaboration publicly. Um, and the reason for that is they both worked really hard to make sure it was that. Um, but obviously underneath you had two strong-willed people who came from very different worlds, very different backgrounds, um, had different instincts and reflexes about the world, and that really fascinated me, how you had this subterranean relationship that played out in some of the internal policy debates, uh, and then this public relationship. And so I wanted to get into the subterranean relationship a little bit and go through the first Obama term and look at the great policy debates on war and peace, uh, starting with really Afghanistan and moving through the Arab Spring, Libya, Syria, Iran, and really try to figure out the role that Hillary Clinton played. Where was she influential? Where was she not influential? To what extent did she tip things in a certain direction? Um, and, and in that way, try to get a sense for, to the extent one can, what kind of a commander in chief she would be. Um, and I, and I want to sort of make a couple of, of stipulations right at the top. My contention is not that these two people sit at opposite poles. They clearly don't. Um, there are, you know, there is a, a world of difference between Donald Trump's isolationism and nativism and where Clinton and Obama sit. Um, they are both lawyers. They both 
are, are huge champions of the rules-based order that the United States put in place after World War II. They want to preserve and defend that order. They believe in diplomacy before military force. Uh, they reject the unilateralism of the Bush years. Um, so, you know, I'm not arguing that they are on opposite sides of the spectrum. What I am arguing, though, is that they have a different view of the role that the United States can play, the way American interventions play out, um, you know, the extent to which you make military force one of your diplomatic tools. Um, I think because of where Hillary Clinton came, both generationally, geographically, the experiences she had as a senator in post 9-11 New York, as a first lady watching her husband uh, conduct the Balkans interventions, that she came into her years as Secretary of State with a different set of reflexes and instincts. President Obama is younger, came of age after Vietnam, lived, uh, had a childhood that was uh, sort of itinerant and included some time overseas. Um, his formative foreign policy event uh, of his lifetime was the Iraq War. He won the presidency in part on his rejection of that, and I think came into office with, uh, you know, a strong conviction that he wanted to uh, not just wind down the wars of the Bush years, but but actually bring Americans to terms with a new view of America's role in the world. It's somewhat different. Uh, than what we've had for most of the post-World War II era, one in which we're not the undisputed hegemon, one in which we recognize limitations. Um, and so I think as you saw these two titanic figures, uh, you know, go through all these debates, you really got an interesting lens into a broader debate which I think is one that's very relevant as we look toward 2016. And that debate is, um, you know, we've now been through the maximalism of the Bush years. Um, it, you could perhaps say the minimalism of the Obama years. Um, so what, it, what is it that we really want America's role in the world to be? Do we want to somehow split the difference uh, and, and, and kind of go for a Goldilocks scenario where we're, we're more engaged but not as engaged as we were? Um, or does the minimalism that Obama uh, set out for this country really in the end appeal to people? Have we truly reached the end of a long period where we view ourselves as the indispensable nation? So those are all the issues I wrestled with. I'm a journalist, not a foreign policy theorist or an academic, so my, my number one driving goal was to write a book that was interesting and colorful and had a lot of details, hopefully new, as many new ones as I could unearth, and I think I did unearth some, some interesting ones. Um, so I'd love to talk about that as well. Uh, and with that, Andrea, shoot. Wonderful. I, you talk about some of the, the areas of disagreement, uh, which illustrate, I think, very graphically their different worldviews. And I, I agree entirely that it, from your reporting and my experience that there is a generational and geographic aspect to this. Um, so let's talk about uh, Libya because that is something she is now going to be forced to defend. She's being attacked now by Donald Trump already on these interventions, Iraq, the 2002 vote. Um, and Libya without thinking is the accusation of the aftermath. And that was an engagement that he came to from all your reporting, you know, reluctantly, and she more or less won the day. That's right. I mean, that m more so perhaps than any single debate was the one where she came in with a different point of view and, and I think turned the debate. Um, at the time, that debate was framed as, um, oddly enough, as sort of the girls versus the guys because there were a number of influential women making the case for uh, the NATO airstrikes to, uh, at that time, to avert a potential genocide in Benghazi. Uh, and the, the other people who were very visible in this debate were Susan Rice, the UN ambassador, and Samantha Power, uh, who at that time was on the NSC, a well-known advocate of humanitarian intervention. She wrote a passionate book about what happens when uh, the United States doesn't intervene to prevent atrocities. Um, so at the time, that debate was very much framed as uh, sort of, uh, one, my colleague Maureen Dowd called it the um, the, the the Valkyries, the the, the women. Um, I I think that that's that was accurate. But what was interesting to me was that really Hillary was the voice that I think pushed it across the finish line. Um, Bob Gates, the Defense Secretary, was 
was against it. Um, he, he felt that it was just, uh, we didn't have a vital national security interest in Libya. And uh, as he's written in his own memoir, it would potentially have meant a third uh, Middle East war for the United States, land war, he was against it. Uh, and at the, at the beginning, uh, Obama very much subscribed to that. And Hillary, because in part she was spending so much time traveling overseas, um, she was getting a very different point of view. The, the Arab neighbors of Libya uh, supported this, wanted the U.S. and NATO to do something. The Europeans were leading the way. Um, the, the British and the French were in the driver's seat. And there was even a sense in the White House uh, in those final days that even if the United States didn't sign on to something, that France and Britain would go ahead in the, in the Security Council and try to do a no-fly zone without the U.S. Hillary was the one who kind of made the key presentation to, to said to the president, we can do this uh, and we're not going to be doing it isolated or unilaterally. We're going to do it with the cover of the Arab world, with the support and indeed the leadership role of our own allies in Europe. And so she turned the debate. And what's interesting in the aftermath of this, and it's kind of forgotten now because of how terribly badly Benghazi turned out, the first several months of the post in intervention were, were really very good. Um, you know, it took a while to get rid of of Gaddafi and it was messy, um, but but the the you know NATO forces finally did that, supporting the rebels, um, and there was even some government formation in the early days that looked like it was promising, and um, and at that time, her own people really began to believe this was going to be a huge winner for her, and you know she was urged in emails that have come out. Uh, subsequently, um, by both Sidney Blumenthal, her, her, her private advisor, and by her staff on the State Department, that she wanted to really lash herself to this, to have, quote, ownership, stewardship um, of this policy. And that, you know, when Gaddafi was finally killed, uh, Blumenthal said to her, you should go to the driveway of your home where even if you're on vacation and take credit for this, this is your moment in history. Jake Sullivan said to her, that he, they were putting together an op-ed where the, she could an, sort of articulate a Clinton doctrine. And so I think of, of all the foreign policy issues that she's vulnerable on, this is a, is a major one, perhaps the biggest because she lashed herself so visibly to it um, and because it was clear that her role was the pivotal one. She wasn't uh, one of several voices, she was really the critical voice. So. Another, which is very uh, closely tied to her relationship with the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, uh, as well as the larger Middle East, is her approach to the Iran negotiations and the way she now is embracing it. Uh, talk, talk about the secret negotiations, the overture, and um, her risk-averse nature in terms of the Israeli-Palestinian dispute, and I would argue Iraq, because we only went uh, the whole time she was Secretary of State, she only went once to Iraq on a Saturday. I was with her. It was not was an too. overnight. Yeah, yeah. And uh, yes, Joe Biden had the Iraq account, but she knew a loser when she saw it. And to, so how much responsibility now should she be taking in the debates to come for the subsequent failures to stand up the proper government, to t put, invest too much in Maliki and, and the lack of... Uh, of real coalition building. There, I mean, I think you kind of nailed the, hit the nail on the head in terms of describing both Iraq and the Middle East peace process. I would argue that she made some fairly pragmatic calculations early on of where she was going to have success and where she was going to be pushing the boulder up the hill. And in the Middle East peace process, I think she judged that with the Netanyahu Likud government coming in uh, and, and an exhausted Palestinian state uh, government authority, that it would, there was just very little hope for a breakthrough there. She'd also named a high profile special envoy in George Mitchell. So I think, you know, to be fair to her, she didn't want to be meddling in his business too much at the beginning. Um, but likewise with Iraq, Joe Biden was in a way a convenient development for her because it was a loser. I mean, there's an interesting anecdote that's in Chris Hill's book 
um, the f former ambassador to Iraq under Clinton, where he, sh he talks about the very trip that Andrea and I were on and how Hillary said to him as she was leaving, you know, Chris, let's stay in touch. If you ever need anything, call me. And then he said that was the last time I ever saw her in, in Iraq. So he it had is just taken over right. as ambassador. So she, she had made a couple of fairly cold-blooded decisions about where she thought she was going to get success, and Iraq was not one of them. To go back to Iran, though, I think this is a fascinating story because it really shows... Um, how her instincts from the election then filtered into the the, the dip diplomacy. Remember, in, in 08, she ran as, as, as a really, I'm not going mean, to use Jane's hated term, she was an Iran hawk. Um, she she was run, ran well to the right of Obama on Iran. She didn't want to have talks with the, with the mullahs without preconditions. She used this famous tough phrase when uh, asked about if, if Iran ever attacked Israel. She said, well, we would be in a position to totally obliterate Iran. So that's what she brought into office. What was interesting is that um, the secret channel, which became the, the vital channel that led to the to the public talks that resulted in the Iran nuclear deal began at her State Department. Dennis Ross, who was her special advisor on Iran, uh, got a visit from an Omani businessman who was a, a, a private emissary of the Sultan of Oman, and he laid out um, a proposal for Oman, uh, which is this, this you know, very tranquil desert sultanate that sort of sits at the mouth of the Persian Gulf, um, to be the, the place where you could have secret talks, do it privately, no reporters would come, would, would hear about it. And, and the Omanis were unique in having ties with the supreme leadership in Iran as well as with the West. And so this whole process began in her State Department. But while that was underway, Senator John Kerry, later Secretary of State John Kerry, um, was making his own inroads with the Omanis. He got to know this same Omani businessman, businessman whose name is Salem Ismaili, and was going out to visit the Sultan. And, uh, you know, he was doing it in a sanctioned capacity. The White House wanted, John Kerry did a lot of this in the first term. He was a sort of a troubleshooter for the administration. It was convenient to have someone other than the Secretary of State handle some of these more fragile endeavors. And so he came away convinced that the Omanis could play this role, that they, they really had real ties to the Supreme Leader. They could get people in the room that the U.S. could speak to that would have true standing back in Tehran. And he came back and pushed this very hard with the White House, with President Clinton, President Obama, sorry. And Hillary, um, while she was not close to the idea, was much more skeptical it would ever lead to anything. And what I learned in talking to a lot of the participants was that when she finally did send her own team out, which she did in July of 2012, um, it was in part driven by her fear that, that Kerry, in his enthusiasm to get something going, was beginning to make promises to the Iranians that we hadn't yet decided we were going to make. And I won't get into the technical details because they're, they're a little bit um, wonky, but the big issue was do you tell the Iranians, we will give you an, a right to enrich uranium um, as, a pre as, a, as a sort of an opening bid for talks? And the, and the administration had not yet decided they wanted to do that. And indeed, that ran counter to years of our negotiating posture. We didn't do that under Bush. Um, and, and there were a lot of people in the administration that didn't want to take that step. The State Department and some at the White House felt that whether intentionally or unwittingly, Kerry was giving the Iranians the impression that we would recognize their right to enrich up front. And so in a way, the early days were an effort, I think, by Hillary to say, look, I'm open to doing something, but we have to be very clear about what it is we're offering and what it is we're not offering. So at that point, in the summer of 2012, she sent out her own team, uh, and, the con and, and they took over the process from Kerry. And then it unfolded uh, in a story that I tell in the book, um, where there were a lot of backwards and frontward steps. Hassan Rouhani is then elected as president of Iran. And this is the other key moment where she diverges from President Obama. She's now left the State Department, carries the Secretary of State. He's every bit as forward-leaning as he was as a senator. Um, and Rouhani comes in on a platform of trying to ease Iran's economic isolation. So he's seeking some kind of channel to the West. 
Um, at that point, there's an enormous debate in Washington about whether we slap Iran with new sanctions. It was called the Menendez-Kirk legislation. It passed the House. The big question was, would the Senate pass it? Um, Kerry and Obama both fervently opposed that, begged the Senate not to pass it, said it would blow up the negotiations. Hillary publicly uh, did not deviate. Um, she even wrote a letter to the Senate uh, to that effect, saying, you know, diplomacy is important. Privately, she told her friends, this would be exactly the moment to squeeze them and see what would happen. She actually believed what some of the Republican senators, and not just Republicans, Menendez, obviously a Democrat, but Benjamin Netanyahu, the Prime Minister of Israel, what they, these people were aggressively advocating for hitting the Iranians one more time because we had them on the ropes, they needed to do a deal, we'd get a better deal if we squeezed them again. And Hillary uh, went along with that. So I think that what's interesting as you now look forward is this skepticism, this willingness to squeeze Iran she was the person who put together the sanctions regime that arguably brought Iran, pulled Iran to the negotiating table. This is now how she will bill herself as I'm the person who's best qualified to enforce this deal. Um, and that's an argument that may make a fair amount of, uh, may have quite a lot of appeal because after all, in the aftermath of this deal, we're seeing all this evidence of the Iranians supporting proxies in Yemen, supporting Hezbollah, causing trouble in Syria. So she, she will position herself as, I was the heavy, I was the, the bad cop the whole way through this process. I'm now the perfect person to enforce the deal the president made. But it gets at, as you said at the beginning, and then I'll stop, the, there is a caution to her diplomatically. Um, just as she's willing to be some, sometimes tough on the, on the question of force, she's also very, very cautious on diplomacy. And you saw it in Iran, you saw it in the Middle East. Um, and, and that's another theme of this book, and much more cautious, by the way, than President Obama was, I would argue. And I would throw Cuba into that category as well. I was just going to say that uh, both Iran and Cuba came up at the very first presidential debate between Obama and Clinton in South Carolina, mm -hmm. when uh, that whole question of whether or not there should be preconditions before sitting down with dictators. And if you asked the Obama people what their legacy would be, um, certainly Ben Rhodes and the other architects of the secret negotiations with Cuba and also the Iran negotiations would say it's these two um, tent poles of reaching out and being transformative. Uh, but Clinton, from the very beginning of the 08 campaign, from their very first engagement rhetorically in that debate, has a very different position on that and came very late to the Cuba engagement. Yeah, I mean, Clinton's views on Cuba were shaped, uh, like many things in her uh, public career, were shaped a lot by what happened during the Bill Clinton administration. And if you recall, um, Bill Clinton, Helms-Burton, the, the act that expanded and deepened the trade embargo, uh, came during uh, the Clinton administration. And so I think she had a fairly standard view of diplomacy with Cuba. And that line in that debate was, things have to change in Cuba first. We need to see real change. We need to see real hu improvement in their human rights record and opening of their political system. President Obama was not out there talking about how I'm going to have a new initiative with Cuba, but in general, he was much more open to reaching out to adversaries. One of the stories that I do tell at the end of this book is about the Cuba opening because it was a frustrating one, not just for her, um, but for John Kerry after her, um, because when she became Secretary of State, I would argue she had something of a change of heart about Cuba. She went down to Latin America on her first trip. I went on this trip and it was in Honduras and it was an OAS meeting. And um, the, the issue on the table was should we readmit Cuba to the OAS? Cuba had been kicked out in 1962. And she was blown away by how every single Latin American leader, and not just the Daniel Ortegas of the world, the, all the people we liked down there were basically coming out and saying, this policy is a relic of the Cold War. It's crazy. It's hurting you in the region. When are you guys going to wake up? And she came back and said to Obama, we should do something about this. Um, so I would argue this is an area where her rhetoric from the campaign and her and and what she felt when she became secretary did change but the, but the issue was 
And so she then began as Secretary of State to say, well, let's explore some things. Uh, let's explore people-to-people -people exchanges. Um, let's explore direct mail. And, and the administration began to take these steps. But it was a very awkward dance because President Obama still had domestic political calculations. There was a very big thing on people-to-people -people exchanges that the administration had teed up for the summer of 2010. And at the last minute, President Obama went to Florida to help a couple of Democratic candidates and got a blast of a message down there. You know, it would be great if you didn't just do this a month before the midterms. And, the, and that whole initiative was put off till the following January. So, so there were these strains of domestic politics and, and foreign policy. And then there was, and this is a key development in Cuba, the, the imprisonment, the detention of Alan Gross, this development worker. And then it fell to Hillary Clinton, as Secretary of State, to try to ask for his release. Um, but the State Department was sort of accused during that period of being unimaginative and formulaic and just saying, release him, release him, while offering the Cubans nothing. And then, you know, as you, as you kind of go forward in time, the president uh, goes on a very important trip. He goes to Cartagena in 2012. Um, and he has sort of a repeat of the experience she had in 09 in Honduras, where, again, a lot of Latin American leaders are saying to him, you know, you've got to change this. Something has to happen. The key exchange he has on this subject is with the president of Colombia, Juan Manuel uh, Santos. And Santos says to him, do something about this. And he says to Santos, if I'm reelected, I'll do something in the second term. He comes back. He authorizes Ben Rhodes, who Andrea mentioned. Uh, to make a secret overture to the Cubans. Um, and there's a very complicated prisoner exchange w uh, between uh, Alan Gross on the one hand, as well as an, uh, an intelligence agent that had been um, uh, imprisoned in Cuba working for us. And then uh, these famous Cuban uh, uh, activists, the, the Cuban Five, who were imprisoned and charged with murder for shooting down a plane. And so th this all happens in the context of a broader diplomatic opening. The frustrating part for Hillary is she's now out of office. Uh, and Alan Gross, who I interviewed for the book, uh, gives her very little credit. He sort of views the State Department as having been part of the problem, not the solution. He's grateful to President Obama, uh, much less grateful to Hillary Clinton. And I think that for Clinton, it's probably, this is probably one that frustrates her a little bit because she did recognize that things had changed and I think she would have been willing to take the steps herself. Um, she uh, was not part of the, this historic opening. She was just a bit player. And I, ha I recount in this book that the day after Alan Gross returns to the US, a free man, um, uh, Hillary's people get in touch with his lawyer and try to organize a conference call. And uh, she gets on the phone with him and says, Alan, welcome home. And he says, thank you. And they have this very strained five-minute phone call where Alan Gross is not giving her much of anything. And she says, well, we were thinking of you. Uh, and then I contrast that to President Obama's State of the Union address where Alan Gross is his honored guest sitting in the balcony with, with Michelle Obama. And, uh, and he sort of gets to have the triumph of saying, welcome home, Alan, and there's a standing ovation. So that's a, another interesting tale that gets at where she started and what she evolved into as a diplomat. And with, within the prism of this election campaign, one of the things that we learned from Mark's book, which a lot of us had inferred from experiences we had but really didn't have the, the wonderful detail of the reporting, is the extent to which for all of her analytical ability and the fact that she is, um, she studies harder than anyone and she's always prepared and she works harder than anyone. Uh, she is at core also, and I don't say this pejoratively, she is a political person. Um, and I've covered her since Arkansas and so I have the perspective of seeing the evolution and uh, you know through the White House years, the ori original White House years and then of course, the Senate race and the Senate and now and then the State Department, now the campaign. But the extent to which she in the State Department was surrounded by her cadre from the West Wing, many of them very accomplished people, but certainly not an easy fit with the diplomats and the Foreign mm -hmm. Service officers. And that Obama gave her wide range, with one exception, that she was not to bring in Sidney Blumenthal, mm -hmm. who had been 
so vicious they felt during the 08 campaign. So she found all of these back channels to him. But the extent to which the, the White House was also political, the political advisors, which who included Dennis McDonough and, and the others in the NSC, um, the, the stabs were more hostile to each other. But you also <coughs> see through the emails the extent to which she was always concerned about her relationship with Obama, her access to Obama. I was struck by the fact that when, frankly, when President Clinton was having open heart surgery, she didn't come back to New York until after she'd had her weekly meeting with President Obama. She wasn't going to forego that opportunity. I'm, you know, yeah, I, it, there's just concern about her access to the Oval Office because the, the White House staff grew exponentially, the NSC, during this period. And if there ever was a, uh, a real divide, which I hadn't seen really since, uh, since the Carter years when Brzezinski was fighting Cy Vance, the State Department was really viewed as, you know, hostile territory. Yeah, I, I, I was struck by, there's a number of things that just sort of illustrate your point. Um, one was the insecurity she had in the first year in particular, but I would say the first couple of years, about the perception that she didn't have access to the president. Um, there, there are a number of emails that are in this book where we, I talk about how she was worried about appearing on a panel with Henry Kissinger because she was sort of worried that people would point out that Henry Kissinger spent half of every day in the Oval Office, even when he was Secretary of State, and was on the phone with the president day and night. She had a standing weekly meeting, and she would have met the president in many other contexts. So it's not to say that she didn't see the president, but she did not have that round-the-clock back-channel access. And she was aware that that might be an unflattering comparison for her. To go to the question, though, of the, the po political focus of the State Department, I, I also there the emails are fascinating. Um, they kept looking at her poll numbers um, religiously. I mean, it was as though the campaign actually didn't end. And Philippe Reines, who's a, a, a very uh, wily and bright guy who was her image maker, um, uh, at one point sent her an email about an upcoming cover of People magazine, and it pointed out that she had a 66% approval rating, which was an all-time high for her. Um, and he said, that's why we keep doing these things and wait until People comes out next week. So even though she was allegedly above the fray in a non-political job, they still viewed her as someone whose public image was vitally important. Um, but your point about the White House is equally valid, and I, there was an, a fascinating thing that I heard that's in this book, that toward the end of her time, in 2012, there was um, fighting between Israel and in Gaza, between Israel and Hamas, and the Israelis were about to launch a major military offensive. She was in Asia with the president. It was a, a sort of a going away trip for the two of them. They went to Burma together, um, and uh, then this situation explodes in, in Gaza. And she goes to the press, she talks to her own staff, and they decide, look, you can parachute in. It's going to be tricky, but you could probably work out some kind of a ceasefire, go to Cairo, go to Jerusalem. Um, and so she then goes to the president and says, you know, this is my recommendation. I think I can fly in and make a, take a shot at this. And they didn't view this as uh, a victory lap for her. This could have all blown up in her face. Who knew, knew how this was going to go? Um, but after she made her presentation and left the room, there was a colloquy between the president and his top people, and one of the things that they were talking about was, well, gee, does she just want to do this to make herself look good, and what is her angle? So here we are four years into the administration. When they know her well, she knows them well, and yet the first instinct of not necessarily the president, I'm not saying the president, but people around him is, well, what's the political payoff here for Hillary Clinton? So that, to me, was a fascinating illustration of how things can change and yet not change at the same time. You know, I, I wanted to ask you about Dick Holbrook because that's such an interesting chapter. And uh, a lot of us knew and cared deeply about him, but also knew the flaws of this, you know, really large personality. And the way uh, President Obama just viscerally did not trust or like him or value his advice, maybe not getting past the personality and not seeing the depth of Dick's experience. We can call him Dick now, right? Because for a while we well, had You to call can him call him Dick. Dick. I can only call him Richard. Richard because, you know. <laughs> I got to know him too late. I got to know him in the Richard years. But uh, before he became uh, so elevated and so serious as Richard, he was Dick, Dick Holbrook. 
um, all through you know mm -hmm. Bosnia and the, uh, the Dayton Accords and all the rest. But how did I mean? She really was loyal, and she I think that was a devastating loss for her. I know it was. Um, she tried so hard to protect him from the White House. Yeah, I I love this chapter, um, and any of my colleagues. I mean, one of my colleagues who I think is sitting in the in this uh, auditorium said, "Don't just make this a Richard Holbrook book because you love Richard Holbrook." But he's an amazing character to write about, um, and uh, and what fascinated me about it is. I think that you could you can you can make the case that it wasn't just a personality issue. It was in part, yeah. but Richard Holbrook also embodied and epitomized the Democratic foreign policy establishment, which Obama ran against and continued to thumb his nose at as recently as two months ago in his interview with the Atlantic. Um, and he also epitomized kind of the Vietnam generation. In other words, generationally, in terms of where he sat, he was just chalk and cheese with President Obama and with President Obama's people. And, um, and, and they obviously distrusted him because he was such a political ally of Hillary Clinton. During the campaign, when he was one of her top foreign policy allies, uh, he made no secret of telling people who had decided to peel off and go with Obama. And that was not a large number, remember? It was Susan Rice and Phil Gordon and a sort of a handful of people. Who, who didn't decide to go with her, you're ruining your careers, you're finished. You know, I mean, if she wins, you're, you're done. And so there was a lot of um, antagonism and resentment after the fact. And, uh, you know, he wanted to be dec Deputy Secretary of State. That was vetoed by the White House. Um, but then when, she, you know, they proposed this idea of the Afghanistan-Pakistan special envoy job, it was tough for the White House to say no because he was you know, staggeringly well qualified and experienced. But once he got the job, he was fairly systematically stymied by the White House in ways large and small. He was left off Air Force One when President Obama went to Afghanistan uh, and pa Afghanistan for his first trip. Um, he was left out of meetings. Um, he was humiliated in little ways. The anecdote that opens the chapter uh, is a, a, a sit room meeting where he's uh, on. Um, the civets on the screen, and uh, and he opens up with a classic Richard Holbrook, flowery opening about Mr. President, not since Clark Clifford, you know, Council Lyndon Johnson has a president face this consequential a decision, and President Obama cut him off and said, Richard, do people really talk like that? And so and he kind of clammed up and was was you know humiliated in front and you know sniggering around the table, and so that to me that human story of Holbrook's um, trials and tribulations is also a nice way to capture the different generational perspectives and cultural perspectives that that Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama brought to the job. And so um, I, I sort of have a lot more in that chapter that gets at this sad story, which of course ended when um, you know he died tragically uh, of a torn aorta. Um, during a, you know, which happened literally during a meeting with Hillary Clinton, um, and uh, and you know, it, it, I think there was this amazing scene which a few of my colleagues have captured as well. Mark Leibovich did in his book, but the memorial service at Ken at the Kennedy Center, where President Obama sat um, amidst the Democratic foreign policy elite and listened to every single one of them praise Richard Holbrook to the skies, when everyone in the room knew how miserable his time had been in this White House and how the president and he never got along. And it was one of these just unforgettable Washington tableaus where it just tells you everything you need to know. And with that, I want to bring all of you in for questions. There are so many, so many subjects. Uh, yeah. Is there a microphone that's being passed around? I don't know. Yeah, it's right there. Um, my name is Stephen Shaw. One dynamic that neither of you have mentioned is that this is, I think, the first time in at least 150 years that a Secretary of State was uh, uh, known to have immediate presidential ambitions and the President took the risk in appointing her there anyway. So I'm wondering how this dynamic, which I can't remember the last um, Secretary of State to run for President, affected their relationship. James Buchanan? James Buchanan, 1857. Um, went in the book. Went I, on to I be, would never have known it if I Went on to be, by, by, by many people's reckoning, the, the worst president in the history of the republic. So not 
hopefully prologue um, in this case. Um, but you raise an absolutely valid point, which, which goes to this question of political calculation. Um, but, and I think it cut two ways for President Obama. On the one hand, the huge political stature of Hillary Clinton was attractive to him because recall in t 2009 he knew for the first year he was going to be completely battened down at the White House dealing with the financial crisis and the and the recession. So and 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 he and yet he wanted to go around the world and mend fences and rebuild alliances. He needed a superstar with her own, or in this case, her own political stature to go off and do that so he didn't have to do it himself. And that's largely what the first year was about. Andrea and I were on a lot of those trips. Um, and, uh, and so that, and the other thing, and I've talked to a couple of his political advisors about what the thinking was when this was announced. Another thing it did is it removed a huge independent political voice from the Senate. And let's say the first term had been a disaster it also removed the possibility of a primary challenge from the person that you basically, you know, had a hard time getting past the first time. So it, on a number of political grounds, it made a lot of sense. The, the risk, and one of his advisors said to me, the huge risk was if the relationship went badly and there was a lot of open dissent and she resigned, for example, or you were first to, forced to fire her, you would have a monumental political storm. So it was not without risks, but there was a lot of valid political reasons why it made sense. And if you had any doubt about what she might have been able to do in the Senate, take a look at what Mark has written. Um, I, had, I was covering the Senate hearing when she really went after Petraeus, when she was on the Armed Services Committee. Uh, about Iraq and Afghanistan, but particularly Iraq, I guess it was the surge. Yeah. And uh, that contrasted with what you report from Petraeus' own words about the 2003 CODEL she was on and, and how she bonded with him and listened and, and really, she had, in representing New York and Fort Drum, she really had a, a real interest in the military and she had a, a pretty good connection with the military from my observation. Yeah. But her, uh, her willingness to turn on Petraeus in this public session uh, was pretty dramatic. Yeah, and he, I mean, yeah, she stuck a shiv into him basically. <laughs> I mean, that's, and, and he felt that way. And, and apparently, n not only did she do it, but they had a perfectly amiable conversation in the cloakroom right before they walked out and she took him down. Um, but, you know, he says, uh, in hindsight, you know, he, he, he gets that and they, they had a very nice entente when he came in. Uh, he was the head of Central Command and she came in as Secretary of State and had him over for a glass of wine and then proceeded to cultivate him assiduously, support him 100% in the Afghan troop debate. Um, the other general, and very quickly I'll go to another question, but there's a general who's less well known than Petraeus named Jack Keane, uh, who I think is more important. Um, who sh with whom she's had a longer and a deeper relationship. Uh, he's a former Army Vice Chief of Staff. He's, uh, by some accounts, the, the really the chief architect of the Iraq surge. He's the guy that went in and told Bush to do this uh, in 2007. And, um, and he's had an ongoing, um, frequent, regular relationship with him. Um, I went to see him last spring. He had just gone to brief her on his ideas about how to fight ISIS and what to do about Syria. Um, one of the things he told her she should support is a, a partial no-fly zone. Um, she supports a partial no-fly zone. So I think he's a key person to understand and the relationship with her. And I should just point out, I mean, if, if you want to understand her foreign policy um, on, in this regard, the council, her Council on Foreign Relations speech is sort of a blueprint. But now, General Keene is listed as Donald Trump's chief foreign policy slash military advisor. Yes. So what General Keene does going forward is going to be very interesting. Totally. Yeah. yeah. I mean, he says for the record he doesn't advise any candidate, including her. Um, and I, I spoke to his chief of staff recently about Donald Trump, and he reiterated, I'm not Trump's advisor, um, but I talk to anyone who's running for president. I mean, this is a standard answer military leaders often give. Um, yes. You want to wait but for them? The, here comes the mic. You may not need it, but <laughs> it's <laughs> better you. for the cameras. Uh, an awful lot of what you said, what you've been discussing, especially about the differences between uh, President Obama and the uh, Secretary Clinton, were about the Middle East. I mean, maybe that's because that's what's important. But there's, aside from Latin America, which you mentioned briefly, there's a whole other world out there. And I'm wondering whether you have other 
you know, whether there's other thoughts about that and uh, whether it comes up in the book and so on. Thank well, you. Let's talk about Vladimir Putin. That's perhaps. the one I was going to go to. Yeah, um, that's I think the other there is a there are other areas in the book. And I will tell you, I have a whole chapter on the pivot to Asia where I don't believe there were differences. I think she was largely she should be credited with being the prime driver of that uh, policy. And the White House largely co-opted it. So they were very much on the same page in China. Russia is a difference. Um, and this is an interesting story because Hillary Clinton, you recall, was the most visible symbol of the reset policy, in part because of that misbegotten exercise where she gave the plastic button to the Russian foreign minister and used the wrong word for reset uh, in Russian. Um, but she was, I think it's fair to say, more skeptical all along about um, Dmitry Medvedev staying power, the, how long Putin would basically allow him to call, or whether he was truly calling any shots, uh, or was just a pliant seat warmer, which is of course what he ended up being. This is this is one of those stories, though, that's that's caught in a lot of revisionism on both sides. If you ask the White House, they'll tell you that she turned on Putin when it was obvious where Putin was coming from anyway, and she she wrote a very well known exit memo to the president on Putin and Russia saying, we need to recognize that this guy's bad news, that this relationship's going to deteriorate, we have to be tough. And um, there are some in the White House that think, oh, well, convenient timing, it was clear which way this was going, you just want to be on the record. Um, the State Department argument is, no, she was skeptical all along, she always thought that Putin was going to come in uh, when the time was right and get rid of Medvedev and things were going to go south. What I think is not disputable, because she's on the record as saying it, is that she would advocate a tougher line against Putin um, in Ukraine in particular. Um, she, at the Brookings Institute last fall, was asked about this and said that she felt that uh, we should have pushed back harder against him. And I think there's evidence, I, I'm told her advisors tell me she would have favored a lethal defensive weapons to the Ukrainian army. Um, that's something that a lot of people inside the administration also favor. Uh, President Obama does not. President Obama's argument is that uh, we will always lose an escalation battle with the Russians because Ukraine matters so much more to the Russians than it does to us. I think Hillary Clinton would probably draw a tougher line on this one, and that is a, a, an area of daylight. And by the way, regarding Putin, um, on Monday, Tuesday, I asked her, um, about a comment she had made to Jake Tapper on CNN last week that blew up a bit because Trump made such a big deal out of it. Uh, she had said that in terms of being able to deal with Trump, she said, I've had a lot of experience in dealing with men who go off the reservation. And <laughs> much to her horror, she got criticized by Native Americans who said that that was politically incorrect. <laughs> But she also got hammered by Trump, who said, you see, you know, there's a bill problem, and she's talking about Bill. So when it came up, when I asked her about it, she said, I wasn't talking about Bill. He, she said, you were there. I was talking about Putin. I was talking about, before that, uh, Giuliani, when he tried to run against me in 2000, and then Rick Lazio, who ran against me. I was running, talking about all those men, you know, that we've all dealt with. Uh, but in any case. There's a funny anecdote which she told in her own, um, in her own book, and I was there for it, and I tell a version of it, where she goes to meet Putin for the first time when she's as Secretary of State. And uh, sh he keeps her waiting, which he typically does. Uh, he does that with Obama, too. Does it too. with Kerry. Does it with Kerry. Does it, did it with the president. Uh, actually, maybe the president said that he didn't keep him waiting as long as... Uh, I know the president talked about this issue of who keeps whom waiting. <laughs> At any rate, kept her waiting, walked in. It was a, a photo op. Um, and instead of just letting the cameras, shaking hands and letting the cameras flash, he delivers this um, lecture to her uh, about how the U.S. isn't doing enough on trade and you should let Russian companies in. And, and as soon as she opens her mouth to reply, he basically says, we're done, and the cameras are all booted out. So he just sandbags her. And we all thought, oh my God, she's going to be ripped. You know, she'll be furious about this. So we get on the plane that evening, she comes back, and, and we're all like, this is going to be great. And she says, oh, no, you know, this was just domestic. You know, he was throwing red meat to a domestic audience. The real story is that afterwards he invited me downstairs uh, to his private office in his dacha, and he showed me this huge map of endangered polar uh, Siberian tigers and bears, and that, which is a huge issue for him. He had a whole uh, meeting about this in St. Petersburg that he invited her to, and she couldn't go. 
And so he invited her to go on a bear tagging expedition. His first choice was Bill. <laughs> but if Bill wasn't available, he hoped that she could come. So in a way, and I thought this was a, a running theme, by the way, in her relations with mm -hmm. these strong-willed foreign leaders, whether it's Netanyahu or Hamid Karzai or Putin, she actually does have an insight into the way these guys work and doesn't and can deal with the kind of aggression, you know, in a way that I think sets her apart from a lot of other people. She always manages to find that element where you can connect with someone, right. even an adversary. I guess we have time for one more question. Uh, Jane, should we defer to the expert in the front row? Well, hardly Adam the President. expert, but I'm loving this conversation. It's rich and nuanced and interesting and just the kind of thing we want to showcase at, at the Wilson Center. So if I could pull away from the book, if this is the last question, and ask about the fall campaign, which both of you are going to cover, are covering and will cover. Uh, what can you do, and also what can we do, to elevate or at least create a serious foreign policy conversation uh, between the candidates and to elevate and focus on nuanced issues in that conversation? Well, um, I would just say from my perspective, <coughs> I thought that the Washington Post and New York Times editorial board meetings with Donald Trump were just revela revelatory. Revelatory. Re revela yes. Revelatory. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and I followed up and reported on them and then talked about it on Meet the Press much to, um, well, it all blew up. but. <laughs> That's okay, because we were talking, it was at the time of the nuclear nonproliferation summit here. And here, Donald Trump is talking without any comment from the other media, really, uh, about, well, let's let South Korea and Japan get nuclear weapons, and they're going to get them anyway, and okay, the Saudis. And he, it was, of course, followed up on CNN as well. And uh, just the fact that he was so casual about it. I'm in, I'm in favor of nonproliferation, but then talking about arming the world and, and getting rid of treata, treaties and backing out of NATO. So I think it is on us to really force a serious conversation. We cannot expect that the candidates will engage in serious debate uh, necessarily head to head. They always have in the past, but I expect that this will be unpredictable in every regard because he is not going to debate in this fashion. If, history is, mm -hmm. is any judge in, the, in what happened during the primary season. So I think that we have to do it on our own. It's, um, it's important. It's gritty. You've, you've absolutely uh, framed it. And she has to explain why, why did they think that once Gaddafi was gone, that there were, um, that, that it was going to be possible to build institutions of governance, and why didn't they follow up better? And the Mubarak, uh, Mm -hmm. We haven't talked about that, but it's wonderfully rich detail in the book and the Frank Wisner episode. Yeah. So she has to explain how her policies would work and uh, whether or not you, at some point you have to make trade-offs between the horror of what could have happened to the citizens of Benghazi and the horror of what Libya now is with ISIS now implanted at least in the coastal cities. So that, that is going to be on us because we cannot expect that they will do it themselves. And it may not be... Um, commercially successful or viable, but I have a platform every day. In fact, if just advertisement, Mark <laughs> is coming on my program today at around 1245 live, and so I've got another opportunity to ask more questions of Mark. I, yeah, I mean, I would just, I think Andrea sum summarized it well. I think I covered his uh, foreign policy speech last week, and um, it, you know, it was a it was just a, a farrago of contradictions and things that didn't make a whole lot of sense when you thought them through. Massive increase in military spending, but removing support from NATO on our e Asian allies. Um, wanted our allies to feel like they could more predictability from the U.S., but then utter in unpredictability in, in fighting ISIS. And so uh, uh, he wanted a foreign policy that he said had the coherence of our Cold War foreign policy, but then in the next breath talked about dismantling half of the institutions that we that constituted our Cold War foreign policy. So it's, it's not an easy a debate. I mean, someone pointed out to me that he can come at her from the left on Iraq. He can come at her from the right on Obama's foreign policy. And left on trade. And left on trade. So it's going to be, as you said, probably not a coherent debate and not a clear 
bright line, although there will be a one line, and she said it in her interview with you earlier this week, and I think she'll just pound this message, which is that he doesn't have the, he doesn't understand the gravity of the issues to be commander in chief and doesn't have the kind of seriousness for the job. And I think in the way that'll be her, her baseline argument will be, we can't trust the nuclear codes to this guy. Um, and, you know, but in terms of the, of, of the details, it will be on us. The only interesting slight footnote I'll make to Trump, and this, I put this in, in the article, there, there are one or two odd echoes of Obama in Trump. One is his disparagement and disdain for the foreign policy elite. He's not going to have people with long, uh, glittering resumes who have failed at everything they've done. Um, and, and, the, and the other thing is, and the other thing is, although Obama couches it very differently, this notion of our allies need to step up and start paying more of the freight for their defense sounds a lot like what he said to Jeff Goldberg about free riders. So there are some interesting, and this is Donald Trump's great uh, gift, he, he does key into issues that have appeal. And th these are issues that might have some kind of resonance, not, not so much the foreign policy elite, but the free rider idea. Yeah. Um, and, and Hillary Clinton will have to offer a persuasive counter argument to that. And I think based on everything that I know about her, where she comes from, and how she believes in the post-World War II American-led order that we've created. And in some ways, she's the ideal person to articulate that case, because she fervently believes it and has kind of the experience. So in a way, maybe that the argument will be at a higher level, if you get past the kind of slogans. The higher level argument will be, I'm the person who wants to preserve and defend this post-war order. And Trump's the one who's going to question the very need for that order and maybe take, start dismantling it. But it just my final thought on that would be that he may be a lot closer to where the yes. m American people are right. in terms of being against the establishment. And this hasn't worked for us. Let's try something new. So um, that's the Bernie Sanders argument as well. So there's, there are a lot of cross currents there. That, and we have to be a lot smarter, frankly, than we have been so far. I need to run only because I've got to do the program. I haven't written it yet, so <laughs> okay. I've got to prepare for this. But so I'm going to excuse myself while Mark stays with you and signs all the books that I know you're going to buy because it is the best investment you will make in terms of understanding um, what has happened over the last eight years and what is likely to happen because it's also so prescriptive. So that's my sales pitch. Thank you very much. Thank Andrew. you. Yeah.